Let's now look at the MySQL Workbench utility. This is an all-encompassing data modeler, SQL query manager, GUI, which allows you to do a number of things with respect to MySQL management. So let's unlock the screen and continue. We'll download it from the MySQL website. It's not so big. Let's get a browser instance going. And we'll navigate to dev.mysql.com slash downloads momentarily. So this is an all-encompassing GUI. It is the platform of the future for interacting with MySQL. And it's available for the common platforms, including Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So let's navigate to the downloads page. We'll search for the Workbench utility. This is the GUI tool. This tool replaces the MySQL query browser that we've looked at, as well as the MySQL administrator, which means it encompasses the feature set from those applications. Now the requirements are pretty heavy. The suggestion is that you have a pretty beefy system with at least four gigs of memory, a minimum of 1024 by 768 resolution, a screaming graphics card like any NVIDIA, and the list goes on and on. So let's pull down the latest package for the 32-bit windows, the MSI. It's only 20 and a half megs. That's the MD5 sum. We can confirm it with JSummer or a similar program. And we'll pick a mirror that's closest to us. We can just go straight to the download page and optionally register. And this utility is available in its open source incarnation, but as well in its commercial incarnation, which extends its functionality considerably. So let's place this document somewhere. Of course, it already begins downloading, and although we didn't see it, and we'll take some notes that will ultimately be transferred to the Linux side, describing this area as MySQL Workbench Utility. So of course it features all-encompassing GUI for MySQL management. And that includes a number of features, including query management, which allows you to manage your queries, define and execute queries via the SQL editor, as well as connection management, which means you can define connections to various MySQL servers, sort of like from Query Analyzer with Microsoft's SQL or Oracle's Query Analyzer. It has an instance management feature which allows you to manage instances on MySQL servers. And it also allows you to model databases, which means you can lay out your hypothetical table relationships and once you've committed to a design, submit the design to a server to be enacted. So database modeling and deployment. So you can test your theories and then dis di distribute the model to a target server. Additionally, it includes a table editor, which allows you to manipulate tables, which means you can alter the structure of database tables, all from the GUI. So, so long as you're able to connect to the MySQL backend, like with Query Analyzer in the Microsoft world, you can perform the bulk of the tasks that you need to perform to manage the server. So we know that it's already downloaded. Let's find our downloads Firefox window and pull up the utility. This will launch the MSI and its current invocation is popping up and we'll walk through the similar themed installer. Custom as always, the option of choice because it allows you to see what would be included. The update feature to provide updates, program shortcut, and the core of the application. So everything will be installed by default, occupying roughly 50 megs of storage. So again, this utility replaces those older tools. Let's just note that it is a feature since it's now 
all consolidate into one tool. So replaces two key tools that we've looked at. The MySQL query browser, which we've looked at from Windows to query MySQL DBMSs, and the MySQL administrator. Both of these tools have been collapsed into the workbench, which means you can administer your server as well as browse queries, execute queries, etc. with the MySQL workbench utility. So now this version has completed its installation. Let's pop up the window and have it launch its home screen again. The suggested specs are not necessarily met with the system that we're using with respect to resolution and memory. Our server has a gig of memory and is currently displaying at 800 by 600. So it's not optimal, which is why some things will not fit ideally in our window. The minimum is 1024 by 768, but we can get a glimpse from this interface. For example, we see links for SQL development, data modeling, and server administration. So over to the right, for example, new server instance, manage imports, server administrator. On the left, development, we can define a connection, for example. We can open a connection and start querying the server. Let's click on a new connection. This pops up a form field, and we need to define it, so let's call it Linux CBT SUSE 1. That is the server. You can connect using TCP IP, a local socket, or TCP IP over SSH, which we've looked at, which is a means, of course, of securing your connectivity to the server for SQL statements that pass to and fro. So, of course, we need to indicate the IP address of the target server. There is an instance running locally, but initially let's connect to the remote instance since it has more databases defined. And its IP is 50 on 3306. We'll connect as the user root or Linux CBT. We can store the password in its vault, which means it'll encrypt it. Store it locally in an encrypted form. Let's indicate that password. And the password, remember, for the root user connecting from any host is a simplistic ABC123, but for the other root users, it's the longer one. So let's look at the advanced section, whether or not to use compression when connecting, which helps to garble some of the communications between the client and the server. Whether or not SSL should be enabled, and NC quotes to quote identifiers. So we can test the connection. Let's go ahead and test it to see that the workbench is able to talk to the server. And it returns connection parameters are correct, which means it's able to log into the server. So once we've got a connection defined, we can open a connection to the server, to any defined server, and if we drop the box, we'll see the instance. It pulls up the credentials associated and logically allows us to communicate with the server by submitting the credentials to the server, which takes a little while to respond. And when it does, we can begin querying the various databases that are available on that remote server. And there we see a beautiful window popped up, which shows a hierarchy of the databases and tables and views and routines if defined on the left. So here we see the hierarchy for the database container. If we navigate to tables and expand it, we'll see the list of tables on the server. And demos is the default table. Double click on it. To the right we see the name and it shows syntax error because we didn't include a full SQL statement. That's just the name. When you double click on an object the name is inserted accordingly. So it's up to you to fill in the appropriate query. So let's erase this, for example. To the right is your query window, which again displays nicer if you're using higher resolution. And below, you can manipulate the database. So let's take a look at the demos table. If we double click, notice that it fully qualifies the database name and the table name. To initiate a query, we can just include a select star from 
and then terminate with a semicolon, for example, and then run this query. It's done by simply navigating to query, execute either the current statement or all or selection if something's selected. And then just like with Query Analyzer for other platforms, we see towards the bottom the results returned in a tabular form with the column headers describing the different fields defined in the particular table. So ID, DID, description, dedescription, so on and so forth, with each returning its values. And click on the bottom, for example, and you can select each, navigate, etc. And you can right button to copy the content if you'd like. You can delete the rows by clicking on delete, which will send the appropriate delete query statement with the unique ID necessary to effect the delete on the server. So again, it's a fully featured interface. Now notice that there's a tab towards the top that governs access to a given server. For each server that you're connected to, there will be one tab. So when you close this tab out, it disconnects you from the server. If you define other servers, let's create a new connection, for example, to the local system. So the connection name will be Linux CBT 2K8, which is the local instance, and we could use standard 3306 or a local pipe, which would connect locally if we'd like, since it listens to name pipes. To keep things consistent, let's just go with TCP and set the user account in this case to be the user that we defined that has access, full access to the server. So then let's test the connection locally and it came back quickly, it didn't have to go across the wire which means we can launch that connection, open connection to query. We'll pull up the local instance first, Linux CBT 2K8. When we see the table, the demos database, LCBT prods demos, we'll see that it contains one table as opposed to three tables like the source server. So there's the database. Notice that the databases are all lower case as we've mentioned. Also notice that you do not see the default MySQL management databases. You see the non-management databases and rightfully so. So let's expand the tables and we see the one table demos. If we expand it we see each of the columns defined within the database and so on. You double click on an object like I just did, it brings that item up in the query window so that you can execute a query. Perhaps using that column, for example, select DID, comma, perhaps the description from, and you can type freely, although you've double clicked on the left hand side, the query window always accepts standard input. So at any time when you use the keyboard to type, the query window is ready to accept your characters. So we'll select it from demos and execute it. The shortcut is Control shift enter or just navigate towards the top and execute it. And to fully qualify this, we could indicate LCBT prods demos dot and Control shift enter to have it execute the query. So there are those two columns. It's always a good idea to qualify your queries fully by using a prefix of the database name dot or the database name dot the particular table that's of interest. Notice also there's some other tabs like overview which is there def by default when we don't have a query that has executed in view. There's some options here such as the ability to add tables but of course if you add a table you have to define the structure to add a view, you add a view, this will allow you to extract the, con the column headers that are of interest to you and it basically creates a view using the create view, view command. You give it a name and select the columns from one or more tables that are of interest, perhaps using joins if necessary. You can also add routines as we've looked at using this particular widget and these items will be stored in the database. So basically this is a GUI that ultimately translates your clicks and gestures into SQL statements that are sent 
to the server. And I also notice when I clicked on output, we see the recent query that was executed. By default, like with PHP my admin, a limit is implicitly tacked on to the end of the command. So this limits the results that are returned per page to 1000. So here are the columns we selected with a limit of 0 through 1000. This is the most recent query. And you can always copy and paste the query to re-execute it or double click on it and have it re-executed up top for example. It'll be the second instance that's run. And here we see a history with a timestamp prefix of when an item was run. For example, 19 seconds we see the selection of the two columns and at six seconds let's click on this entry here we see the failed query this is the one that didn't run because we didn't fully qualify the database and table name and the snippets area allows you to store snippets of code that you reference frequently so if you perform SQL queries or certain queries quite commonly you should store those snippets in the snippets area and if you do define views and routines they'll obviously show up within this area views and routines if you do define them so the default hierarchy shows us those tables views and routines per database and the databases that are reflected are the non system databases so neither the information underscore schema nor the MySQL databases are reflected in this particular dump. You can right button on objects to see, ob to see information and options related to that particular object. For example, you can drop the schema, which is basically a drop database. But of course you're prompted because that's a dangerous action. Click on drop test because we don't need the test database and that will execute a drop and remove the database for us and eventually those items will be gone now the interface doesn't automatically update which is why we're not seeing the removal of the test instance instantly but after refreshing the instance will be gone or the database in this case will be removed from the list so currently we have one window open for one host if we navigate to home if you notice the interface is nice and clean and if we navigate up towards the edit you'll see the option to undo if you've done something that's potentially damaging and it shifts the home to the right so let's click on it again this is the home page which allows us to then open another instance so let's click on open and pick our SUSE one instance which is the other instance that's currently available and this will submit the credentials to the target MySQL server and if it passes then will allow us to interact with the interface with the instance via the interface and of course this supposes that the target instance is up running and available via TCP 3306 on the following IP address so now we have two instances going so the information from SUSE 1 has been loaded into the interface 2k8 remains and we can copy and paste queries between them so for example if we were to take this and just right button copy it and then navigate over to the SUSE 1 instance which has the same database with even more tables and then control shift enter to execute the query there then this will launch it on that side but notice the big difference in terms of querying on the Linux side things are case sensitive so LCBT prods again these are some of the smaller nuances across distributions or across distributions of the software across platforms so let's control shift enter again and our database name is missing an R and we'll try it again and now it returns the results so case sensitivity is something you must be concerned about as you move from platform to platform so again, we can alternate between these two items. And again, this is only a small subset of the features that are available. Also notice below you get connection information, although within the 8x6, it's a bit hard to see, but it shows the name of the server, the IP. And if we can kind of move this over a little bit, that we're connected to 50 on 3306 and that it's, this is its host name. 
And if we head towards the left, you'll see the server and its revision and any other applicable information. So you get connection information details on the left, databases on the left like you would with PHP MyAdmin, and the view is updated eventually, either after disconnect, reconnect, etc. So we've deleted a database, drop database, we've executed some queries, and there are a number of other things you can do with this interface. For example, you could develop a diagram that's ultimately submitted to the server as we've mentioned. You can receive an explanation for the current query. It tells you what the query does, how it's performed, what it returned 111 rows from the particular columns that were selected from that table, etc. You can, on the fly, reinitiate a connection to the server. So in this case, this will reconnect to the current instance, and we'll just wait for it to redo it, as well as reconnect to the local instance, which will then update the list of databases that are available, which should reflect that we've removed the test database. Again, this is across the wire to a server that's relatively busy, so it takes a while. And for the local instance, we can do the same, navigating it into its area and reconnecting. And then notice, once we drop the arrow, the only non-administrative database is LCBT prods demos as opposed to test. So test is now gone once we've reconnected to the database server. You can manage your DB connections independently of the main window. Here they are. The same form that was used to define the connections is presented to the right and on the left we see a list of stored connections. So you can maintain your connections from here, make changes to them. You can also click on new to generate a new connection object. You can also define the default database that you'd like to connect to. So whenever connecting, let's say, to the local instance, we want to be connected to LCBT prods demos. That will default us to that default database. And perhaps when connecting to SUSE 1, we'd like to be connected to the MySQL administrative database. Let's see what happens when we indicate a database that doesn't show up in the drop list automatically. So let's go back to query, reconnect the server. In this case, we'll be reconnecting to the local instance. And notice the default database is LCBT prods demos. Let's then navigate to the remote system, which doesn't have a default database currently defined. Let's reconnect to it. This takes a little bit longer. Again, it's across the wire and the server is busy. And it's also a slightly older server. So it takes a little while to cooperate. But once we connect, let's see how it handles the administrative database that isn't published by default. You certainly can run queries against that database, whether or not it's displayed in the drop-down list. And notice, we're now reconnected, but it still doesn't show the default database. So how about running queries against that server? Well, let's define a query. We'll select star from mysql.user with the control shift enter and that'll execute the query for us and there we see the results. So for security purposes the system administration databases information underscore schema and MySQL are hidden from the object browser view but they're there and you certainly can access them and you can certainly manipulate records for example here's a record that allows the user root to connect from any host and if you right button, you can copy the row, copy the field content, etc. So note in the upper right, the number of records that were fetched are returned. Just like in the terminal monitor, the number of records that are pulled are returned. If we executed the same query against the remote side, let's just do a status to see what the current situation is. And we're connected to the win host. So if we drop the connection, and then connect to the remote side. Or perhaps we'll do it in a putty window since it's on the remote system. So let's connect to the local system and do a select star from MySQL user. This will dump the standard out 
the contents of MySQL and that's from the Windows Server. It went across the wire. Now let's log into Terminal Monitor without executing a query with the E option and we'll do so locally to 50 to see what result it returns. Since it's local it'll come back quicker and that's the wrong password. So let's drop it, give it the right password and then try it again and that's the wrong user as well so user root prompt for password try it one more time and let's have it go with localhost again this is just a an issue of matching the right user to the right password so now we can select star from mysql.user and notice at the end five rows have been returned although they're different servers but whenever you're inside of the terminal monitor environment the number of records returned is always evident so that's what we see in this fetched number of rows and if you hover over these column headers you'll see the ability to resort on the fly so for example sort ascending which begins with percent and terminates with localhost or sort descending which will start with localhost and terminate with percent sorted by the second column as you can see since it's sorting in a descended fashion you can move to the last row first row in between rows so it's a nice way to be able to navigate rows you can also select a row directly like you can in a spreadsheet by just clicking on it you can also refresh the data in the event that this table that's in view changes frequently a reinitiation of the query occurs you can export the record set to a file this is a useful feature so that you can import it into a spreadsheet perhaps CSV TSV or CSV CSV for the tab separated as well as comma semicolon separated or comma separated and the other two formats HTML XML you dump these items to a file and it'll be made available so that you can open it for example if we dump this to an HTML file and we described it as MySQL users so we'll place it in administrator documents that's a fine directory this will be Linux CBT 2k8 MySQL users.html and this will save it as an HTML file and then if we browse the contents from our directory administrator documents or just simply documents we now have an HTML formatted page basic table but it brings back the information that's of interest to us and we see the users that are defined on the remote system root at localhost root at SUSE one root at percent and for these two users we don't have an encrypted password defined so that's something that's worth exploration to tighten up we also see the various applicable privileges that are assigned to the user with all of the SSL related columns blanked out because the server currently does not have SSL functionality built into it so it's not applicable but would be if we built SSL support into it also some additional menu items such as community which takes you to the blog tells you facts about the workbench learn how to code it because it is automatable another feature we didn't mention there's a scripting shell environment that allows you to script workbench to do things for you it's also modular when you obtain the commercial version you're able to take advantage of its modular environment it supports plugins for objects catalogs and utilities the ability for example to obfuscate object names in a catalog so when you publish information that's to be shared with others you can anonymize the information so that you don't leak any sensitive information and as you know you can manage your connections and launch the query database to connect to a specific database to launch queries against it for those that are not open of course we currently have two that are open and anytime you can log navigate back to the home page 
and take a look at some of the additional options for both SQL development and data modeling as well as server administration. You'll also notice that each of these columns maintain their information independently. In other words, they're almost like separate worlds. So for example, if you wanted to administer the server, the functions that you're able to perform using the MySQL administrator text shell tool or the administrator GUI that this supersedes. So if you navigate to server administrator, for example, you're prompted to select a, a server to connect to, but none are defined. So you'd figure that the definitions would be pulled from SQL development, but they're not because a tool is made to be used by folks of different persuasions. The DBA who wants to model the database, the developer who wants to write queries, test queries, execute queries, and the administrator, let's say the systems person who needs to manage the server, start, stop, etc. So although it's not in view because of the resolution limitations, if you click on new server installation, you can define access to a remote server. Now notice you can take the parameters that are already defined for one or more instances. So we'll take for SUSE 1, click next, and these settings were tested very quickly. It got the version, the OS version, and it opened the database. In other words, in order to be able to manage the server, some prerequisites must be met, including a way to get to the target server, which is usually SSH, and the ability to log in as a user who has privileges to administer the server. And here we'll supply the root account for the tool to log in and be able to administer the instance, such as starting, stopping, restarting, etc. These are the same functions you'll find, as I've mentioned, in the MySQL Administrator shell tool. So here we'll specify root's password, or if you've got a public key, private key combination that could be used to authenticate as well. So you could copy the key and make use of that, or generate a public key, private key pair, set up the key using SSH copy ID, or just copy and paste it, and then the tool will use that for authentication. The installer has determined that we're running Linux, as opposed to the other supported MySQL platforms. And it wants to know the installation type. So we'll look for a SUSE related MySQL package. And this is the package that's in use. So let's click on next. And if you notice on the left, we're basically walking through the various settings. Now, this wants to test SSH connectivity. So let's specify the password, have it save it in the vault, which means it encrypts it and then have it connect to the host and try to administer the server, which basically means starting and stopping and checking the configuration. The same things you're able to do with MySQL admin utility. So testing host machine is done. So far, so good. The credentials we've supplied all work well. So here's a synopsis of the parameters, the host's IP address, its port, the user, we're not using a key file currently, but we could, as well as version of MySQL, the default location of the config file, the instance name, it's using the default instance, which is simply MySQL D, as opposed to MySQL D1, 2, 3, etc. Well, 1 is the default MySQL D, so instead of 2, 3, 4 through N, this is the path to start and stop, or these are the paths to start and stop. And this is how it can check to see whether or not it's actually running. It'll sudo in. So that means we could have it log in with MySQL and then sudo to root. And let's click on next. This is the default name of the instance that the tool will keep track of because it is able to manage multiple instances. It's also able to generate instances for us in the event that you, let's say, are an ISP and would like to manage multiple in instances. And now it returns us to the home page. So if we click on server administration now, we see the named instance. We can click on OK, and then this will load the properties of that instance, which means we can actually interact 
with the instance, which will allow us to do things such as start, stop, and to troubleshoot whether or not the instance is up and running and the like. Now, of course, it takes a while to connect and transfer all this information over the SSH connection. If our target server were less, less busy than it currently is, then this would be expedited, but it isn't the case with this particular server. So we'll just wait it out. So now once we're in this mode, in addition to the development interfaces in the home tab, we have a new tab and we see a graphical display of information that's usually returned in a character driven way. So the synopsis is on the left, IP, version, the fact that it's running, the instance name, the load on the server, the memory utilization, 96%, which is not unusual for Linux to use the majority of the memory, the number of connections, seven, the traffic, the query cache hit rate, and so on. Now we see the ability to stop the server. We can clear any messages that are in the message log. We can interact with the configuration of the server. The configuration directives are loaded into the form where we can do things like turn off networking, which doesn't bind to a TCP IP port, enable name pipes, change the base directory, all of the directives that you can modify directly in my.cnf. Now again, because of the resolution constraints, we're unable to scroll and show some of the other options as smoothly as it would had we used a high resolution like 1024 or higher, which is the suggested resolution. But this is enough to give you an idea of how this wonderful utility works. And we can quickly alternate between the administration of the server from a systems management perspective to development, development of queries, execution of queries, testing of queries on various servers. When we're done with an instance, simply close it out, close out the tabs, and then ultimately the last tab is the home page, which presents us various options. Now the data modeling, we'll skip this because you'll need a hypothetical or an actual production layout that you'd like to lay out. But this utility uses industry standard EER. It allows you to model using objects the layout of your tables, how they relate with the various join keys and so on. And once you've come up with a model that seems to fit your data flow, then you can have those settings distributed to a server and as a consequence, the tables, their relationships, the join keys, etc., will be auto populated, auto created for you. So that's one of the neat things about the data modeling. We'll save that for a separate section altogether where we dedicate time spe specifically to laying out a hypothetical model. We just wanted to give you a sense for how useful the workbench utility can be for manipulating local as well as remote. MySQL instances. So long as you've got credentials, you can connect to a remote system and submit those items. Now, currently, we still have our notes items in this notepad window. Let's just copy and paste everything from here into the putty window. And then that'll update our notes. Gedit will need to be refreshed as a consequence. Let's find this putty window. We'll quit and sun as a user Linux CBT. We'll find our notes file. Just sitting on our desktop and we'll modify it using nano. Not the backup version of course. Control V towards the bottom and then right button to paste in the putty window and then save the changes. Now we can log off the server, so consider downloading and using Workbench from MySQLAB. It's a wonderful utility, and it shows a lot of promise, which is probably no wonder why Oracle now owns both Sun and MySQL. So let's log off the server, see what the current status of our gedit window is. This will kick us off momentarily. And we'll pop back to gedit 
and we'll reload because it knows that the file has changed outside of its auspices and there are the notes.